Good day, dwellers and random viewers. This is Shadow with Shadow's Cozy Inn. Today we are going to dive into a review of all reviews. I aim to pick apart the biggest release of 2023 to date, which is Hogwarts Legacy. I will be channeling my inner Potter nerd, so, so to speak. However, my review will be based solely on the game impressions, its writing, and character development specifically. I'm reviewing the, this game about two weeks. Uh, or so after beating it, as I wanted all the experience from the game to settle in as I think it over and determine my true thoughts on the game. I did not want to do this review right after I beat the game because I didn't want to be biased uh, because I was more hyped or whatever. So I thought that waiting a little bit and then making the review would be best. I did not watch any promo materials prior to the release. I, in fact, stayed completely away from the game because I didn't want to get on this hype train and then be disappointed. So I have no clue if any hype podcasts were made prior to release or not. I chose to be completely unspoiled and unfamiliar with the game when I started playing it. Other than one podcast I did with another creator regarding the game where we watched like an official trailer or two and talked about it. So, that being said, let's dive in. Alright, so the game is set in 1800s and overall aesthetically it's quite pleasing. Visuals of the game are beautiful, complemented with music and sound effects. Characters seem to uphold the body language and expressing themselves befitting to that era. Although some of the outfits I'd personally burn on the pyre. <laughs> They were just a little too ugly for my taste, but again, devs did stick to the time frame that the game is set in and there was quite different fashion choices back then. So, who are we in this game? We as players are given tools to create a custom which are wizard with a wide selection of hairstyles and hair color, eye color and shapes and so on and so forth. I played with two characters to compare them. My live stream character was a witch placed in Slytherin and she actually turned out quite cute. I was surprised, usually I make ugly custom characters. And off stream character that was a Hufflepuff wizard. Here I'd like to know that I much preferred a female protagonist uh, to the male one purely based on the voice acting quality as well as female models seemingly having much better micro expressions in the cutscenes which made her feel a little more alive as a character rather than making her behave more like an NPC. Male protagonist unfortunately sounds really bored and very unimpressed. I however did not appreciate to be referred as a they. We were given choices between male and female for a reason and I really wish devs weren't lazy and cheap and had voice actors record proper pronouns to make the game a little more immersive. The devs did a great job however of using together source materials and honoring uh, them. Castle embodies both Hogwarts from the first two movies as well as the castle from the Prisoner of Azkaban movie on and going onward. Devs uh, also did a great job with common rooms for Hufflepuff and Slytherin. Fantastic way to represent uh, the sigil animals in my opinion. Hogwarts uh, got the boring common room from the movies and I haven't seen the Ravenclaw one but I have heard that Hufflepuff and Slytherin got the coolest common rooms which means probably Ravenclaw is a little bit on the meh side. But again, I won't judge because I haven't seen it. The general world space is huge. The castle is actually quite easy to get lost in and I firmly believe that even after 100 hours of playing the game, I still cannot find my way around without a built-in GPS system. Despite the its size, the world never feels empty. There are always enemies or friendly NPCs to be found. But it's also done without overpopulating the map. Quite balanced in my opinion. I was worried that the world outside of the castle would be a little too empty, but it's actually turned out to have been done quite well. So how is the story itself? How does it fit in the frame of the universe? I was surprised that Avalanche Team writers managed to present the story in very rowling style. The game doesn't stand out as something not made by Joanne. However, it doesn't mean I don't have questions or head scratching moments or find flat out retcons. If we are to, to take a step back and think about the story in broad strokes, it's fairly decent. The game itself, in general, is fantastic. However, 
It's also pretty telling that the devs made the content cuts and when we start digging into details, questions start to arise. We start the game as a fifth year and I immediately have questions that were never answered in any capacity. Why the fifth year? Was my character a witch prior to 15th birthday? Am I pure blood, a half blood, a mud blood? What am I? Where I'm from? Are we a transfer from another school? Which one? Where our parents, family members, the entire premise of our protagonist is extremely vague and I'm not even sure if it's a good thing. We quite literally pop into existence out of thin air after the character creator. I really wish we could build a personal backstory to our protagonist similarly how it was done in say Guild Wars 2. At least there is some sense of being a character. Then we discover we can see traces of magic. Why? I still have no idea even though I've beaten the game. Despite setting out on four trials plus other obstacles, it's never clear what this gift is or where it came from. Professor Rackham never goes into much detail and is seemingly clueless about this type of magic himself despite teaching it to other students how to wield it. There is a speculation voiced that Hogwarts founders use this magic and presumably that's how they built the cath castle, but it's only a theory. If that's the case, are we related to them? Are we related to Rackham? Is it Dora? If writers woven this into the plot, at least make an attempt to explain these details, as they are an important part of the character development for several NPCs plus the protagonist, as well as lore and world building. It's a little weird that the entire premise of the plot of the game is never fully explained or explored. It made me wonder if some parts of the plot regarding this were actually cut and devs never explained or established a workaround for it, as well as some other parts of the game. While it's exciting to be a student and all, this experience is rather surface level. For example, in old games like Harry Potter 1 and 2, when we were taught a spell, uh, we had some kind of test to practice that spell. Here, we do tasks prior to learning spells, and professors never truly test us on the expertise. There is no actual learning involved, where you would fail a spell a few times before it clicks, so to speak. Nope, the protagonist is seemingly a genius of magical world and masters every spell on the fly, including complex unforgivable spells. I also have questions as to why some professors teach us things that are not within their teaching expertise, as well as an imbalance of teachers' involvement in the catch-up efforts. Charles Professor, that I don't even rec recall the name of, and Professor Weasley teach us one spell each. However, Kogawa, Sharp, Garlic, and Defense Against the Dark Arts Professor, that I also don't recall the name of, teach you at least two spells per person. Why do professors have any business teaching you spells instead of the two professors whose subjects deal directly with spell casting? That's not even mentioning how a student, of all people, teaches you unforgivable spells plus one forbidden explosive spell, and we master them as easily as snapping fingers. I can get the feeling it was done to cover up for the fact that the classes section was cut during production and there isn't much for those teachers to do to get some screen time. However, it's absurd from the lore standpoint. Some of the spells are also pretty useless, such as Reparo, for example. I probably used it like five times in the entire game. I also wish we had Patronus Charm instead of uh, instead and fight some Dementors, or Ridiculous, and have some Bogart enemies. Additionally, having Levioso, that is not a canonic spell to begin with, and Wingardium Leviosa felt very redundant. Why was that implemented? There were plenty of other spells that could be brought into the game that would be useful. Learning Alohomora was migraine inducing. There are three levels of Alohomora spells that are locked behind collecting statues all over the place, but not a Patronus charm. Devs added divination and astronomy classes for some reason. Both were pointless, especially divination. Why not substitute that with something else? Another subject? Or expand potions on herbology, for example? Also, I'd rather they cut Merlin trials by like half and pour that effort into more work on details, plot points and character development. However, there's one moment I absolutely loved about the story. Each house got its own mini arc when doing a quest about Jackdaw. So they're on Got Octopus Cave while Hufflepuff took a trip to Azkaban Prison and Gryffindor had something to do with the ghosts and their headless hunt club or some such. What's even cooler that investigating Jackdaw's death, each house got its own direction, so to speak. The core 
of the plot is the same as well as participant, but the setting of solving the mystery takes you completely in a different direction, depending on the house you're in. I think it was a fantastic choice by the devs. I only wish other sections of the main quests had the same house-influenced mini-arcs. There's also one of the greatest highlights of my entire playthrough. I really wish trials were affected somehow uh, by the house you were placed in, deriving from the house personality traits and features. Speaking of trials, I find it a little bonkers that Professor Fig is totally A-OK -okay with the student who apparently never did magic before, taking on dangerous tasks that not even every well-trained adult wizard can overcome, instead of alerting every possible professor and figure of authority to the danger at hand with Ren Rock and company. Yes, it's kind of a theme of Harry Potter universe, but let's ponder over that for a second. Harry's case was a little different on too many levels. Whether Harry was a good wizard or not is a debate for another video. Circumstances for him were a little different. He had a wizard like Dumbledore to back him up, not to mention other professors, including Snape low-key rooting for him. Even a try wizard tournament makes more sense since you technically have professors and other wizard keeping an eye on the events. Even then, still, participants were known to perish. Our character doesn't have that kind of support. Not to mention, we have no clue what we are up against, while Harry was at least somewhat familiar with his adversary. Plus, I highly doubt Professor Fake possesses magical talents on Dumbledore's level. I find adults of the wizarding world very responsible, especially when it comes to kids. I really wish writers broke that cliché and managed to work in our dependency on adults and professors a little bit more. That would be logical, given that we are a noob in magic casting. Plus, give professors some more screen time and some productive things to do. It would also break that chosen one cliché. Also, I was a little bummed how unperturbed everyone involved, including my own characters, was when we discovered we can wield ancient magic during the Hogsmeade accident. <laughs> there was literally zero reaction from anyone, including our protagonist, who just shrugged it off like it was nothing. This makes no sense. This kind of discovery is equivalent to any one of us in real life suddenly realizing we can wield magic for real. Would you just shrug it off? Or would you be shocked, speechless, and take time to process the reality of it? Trials specifically aside, the story is actually not too bad. You start classes, you meet new students, and you make new friends and enemies. It has its moments involving Rookwood and Rainrock, awesome moments like saving a dragon and Highwing. However, sometimes I could almost feel the influence of the Magical Beast movies overpower the main Harry Potter inspirations, and that is something I didn't like. I am not a fan at all of Magical Beast movies. I feel like they're cheap knockoffs attempting to milk the money out of a well-established franchise. Rookwood even looks like a discount version of Colin Farrell. As far as I'm concerned, the game uh, did break the lore a little bit with the NPCs, because some of the characters don't behave how the students of their house would. For example, the kid from the flying lesson is from Ravenclaw, forgive me, I forgot the name. But his demeanor is very Slytherin. I do know, however, that he was voiced by the actor who played Lee Jordan in the first two Harry Potter movies. There is also another girl who experimented with charms and sent us into the library to fetch her books or some such. Cressida or something or other. She was very rude and arrogant, which also would fit better in Slytherin rather than Gryffindor. Ironically, the best NPC in the game, Sebastian, is too nice for Slytherin and would probably fit better in Gryffindor or Hufflepuff. That being said, the devs seem to have good knowledge of uh, the source material, but they fumble in smaller details and flat-out retconned uh, Priori and Cantatum that in the game occurs between two wizards that do not have related wands. One could argue it's because both wield ancient magic, but I feel like it's a weak excuse and breaks the lore regardless. And I don't care it happened in the movies. It breaks the lore in both cases and of story. Additionally, the game has no repercussion system if you swim in the Black Lake, wander into Forbidden Forest, or traverse the castle grounds at night. While it's better for the exploration freedom, it's lore-breaking all the same. The final boss uh, is a bit underwhelming, in all honesty. Mechanics were very simplistic. Renrock in general is a weirdly written antagonist, but more about that a little bit later.
To be honest, I found some NPCs fit well within the world of Harry Potter, or within World of Hogwarts Legacy, but some really came off fake and forced. Possibly their names created that impression. Characters like Sebastian Feig and Professor Weasley, Headmaster Black and Sharp really felt like they belonged in the setting, but some like Garlic, Natty and a few others stuck out like so sore thumbs for some reason. Not sure if it's missed personalities or their names, but something felt off about certain characters we meet. The character that caused me to ask the greatest amount, number of questions was Professor Fig. He was also my least favorite character from all those we interacted with most often. I don't understand the development of his character no matter how I try approaching it. It's never mentioned what he teaches in the game and he never taught us any lessons either. His constant desire to keep secrets from Professor Weasley irritated me since he was willing to put a newbie wizard child in danger of events and powers he didn't fully understand. He was extremely reckless and negligent individual. I feel like the devs tried emulating Dumbledore on him but he ain't it, Chief. Particularly because Fig lacks renown of magical capabilities of Dumbledore. I also always consider Dumbledore's quirkiness a bit of a facade to throw people off a little bit, while in reality he was a very calculating and smart person. Fig isn't any of that. He seems almost completely unperturbed after the carriage crash and decides to take us on a side stroll instead of into some ruins he has no knowledge of, while logically he should have found the best way to get protagonists to safety, off the school, and only then ponder what happened and why. Not to mention alert Professor Weasley at least to the events if he didn't trust Black. This behavior throughout the game made me suspect him being a third party bad guy. That's why in the finale I lacked any kind of emotional attachment to the character no matter how good his deeds were and how much he came through, I still was not impressed. Arguably the best supporting NPC of the game. Not only Sebastian had a great voice actor who did phenomenal job for his first two voiceover job, Sebastian was very well written and adventuring with him through several quests made me really care about him. Despite not, despite not really fitting into Slytherin House in terms of personality traits, he was prone to some mischief and uh, was a great character to meet. His tragic and dark fate actually made me incredibly sad and I eventually opted to help him uh, in, in, the, in the finale when I was prompted to. There was a, a bit of an abrupt and unreasonable change in his character at some point, which made me wonder if there was some more material planned around him that was cut during production. However, overall, he was a very well-designed character and is the best companion in my opinion. And his line's delivery beats Natty for sure. Meaning, despite having the same lines, Sebastian came off more concerned for the protagonist while Natty came off as a nosy person looking for gossip scoop. When it comes to Nettie, I really like her accent, and I could listen to her talk all day. But, as I mentioned before, a voice actress didn't do as good a job as a voice actor for Sebastian did. That made Nettie's character sound nosier, rather than someone who wants to help and who's trustworthy. Even though Nettie did come through and was a great help on several occasions, I still couldn't come around to fully trust her or like her. We don't learn much about Nettie's past, till the very final main quest instance. And I feel like those details should have been revealed much sooner, building more trust between the character and the player, as well as possibly develop quests to reflect her personality more when she was involved. Alright, time to talk about the elephant in the room, Ranrock. I am not going too much into detail because this video would be hours long. I also want to avoid major spoilers. So some spoilers are ahead, but you know, not too much, I hope. So Ranrock as a villain was very poorly written in my opinion and was very poorly developed. One of the major reasons for it is that we didn't directly interact with him as players until the final battle. That negatively affected the relationship between the character and the player. 
as we do not get enough material to develop any kind of emotional response to him. If we are to compare antagonistic characters from, say, Assassin's Creed Odyssey and Ghost of Tsushima, you realize that the way they were written and developed, you grow to dislike, hate or despise your enemies throughout the game. However, it's achieved primarily through the direct content be contact between a nemesis and the protagonist. Odyssey has an entire guild of enemies that we met, got to know and eventually eliminated. Many of them were woven into the quest to establish the link with the protagonist. I particularly grew to dislike Cult of Cosmos after meeting one of the secondary NPCs and that one NPC changed my entire perspective on the plot and motivated me as a player to help Cassandra and her family. And that way I actually got the best finale possible at first try. Same goes with Ghost of Tsushima, when Jin's enemies killed his people, invaded his country, robbed and threatened to destroy, destroy everything he held dear. I was particularly enraged by Mongols killing foxes, but that's me, okay? That was my trigger. <laughs> When, when it came to Hogwarts Legacy, I was completely unfazed by the antagonist. I uh, wasn't threatened by them or angry with them. They were just there. Voldemort stirred more emotions in readers and moviegoers than Runrock ever would. He was very planned in that regard and his minions were very generic. Main issue I took with Runrock was his reason for the entire ordeal. A hissy fit. I cannot even call that a revenge because he didn't come across as power hungry tyrant to me. He was just triggered by an event of the past where someone was rude to him and you know someone attacked him due to a misunderstanding and that there is a there is all there is to it. If he was meant to be a power hungry tyrant, I did not see it or felt it. Sorry. For me personally, Renrock's motivations and his whole involvement in the plot actually draw away from what's seemingly more important and was the focus of the game, ancient magic and what it can do. While he was somewhat involved in this, um, I felt like as a result of his crusade, the main aspect, which is ancient magic, didn't get enough attention and development and left a lot of questions unanswered. I think the game should have had multiple endings for the main quest side characters make players' dialogue choices and actions affect the outcome of the story. I also wish our companions joined us for final battle similarly how it was done in Deathly Hallows where everyone stood against the common enemy, not just one group of selected few. Most professors we meet are either discount versions of the ones that we grew to love in Harry Potter books and movies, namely Professor Weasley is a discount version of McGonagall, Sharp is a weaker version of Snape, but at least, as I have said, they fit believably into the setting of the world. Other professors were quite weird, especially Garlic. She definitely grows some happy shrooms in her garden somewhere. I found her personality to be a little bit creepy, if not disturbing. Charm's professor was so bland I can't even recall his name. And Flying Professor was trying to be the version of Madame Hooch, uh, from the first movie, but didn't quite make it. As for the students, Ominous was a little bit weird character. His distrust for the protagonist makes sense if you pick any house but Slytherin. It's warranted then. But when you play as a Slytherin student, he treats you like you're public enemy number one. It's weird. I often felt that he has bipolar disorder because the way he behaves almost looks like sudden mood swings. I partly blame uh, the actors, the actor to fault for this, as he seemed to be unsure where to take his character and then end up being all over the place. But I also blame the writers for not adjusting the character based on the house of the protagonist. It's also quite obviously obvious that um, Ominous is, was made to be a mild reference to Draco Malfoy, who, was, who has brought up his father's elevated social status on several occasions, yet who also ended up realizing that blood status is a lot of crap. Unfortunately, Draco's character's development and behavioral changes made sense in both books and the movies, because he was well written by Joanne and well performed by the actor. Ominous, on the other hand, doesn't quite meet the mark due to the inconsistencies of his portrayal. Other than Sebastian, Poppy Sweeting was my favorite character for several reasons. 
one she loves an animals uh, and wants to do everything in her power to help them i am the very same way in real life i love animals i'm a rescue mom of three furry butts and uh, I can't stand animal to see animals in distress. That's why I can never work in the animal shelter. I'll just end up adopting too many poor mistreated furries than I can manage. Two, I love Poppy's character development where she firmly stood against her family's occupation and proved it with actions instead of just words. I love the character's contrast uh, and how much more believable she's about it than, say, Ominous was. I loved questing with Poppy and the way her arc is written. It gives you so much sense of gratification that you did just something good. Same goes for the questline with Deke. I think he was a very sweet character who was very well presented. So what does make this game great? I absolutely recommend this game to anyone who loves Harry Potter franchise. Hogwarts Legacy has tremendous exploration and nostalgic value. The game does a great job sort of immersing you into its world and adventures. I the game achieving it is remarkably similar to Wizarding World of Harry Potter in Orlando, where you walk into the Diagon Alley and you forget you're in Florida. The story has some good and solid moments like house dependent quest arc about Jackdaw. That was such a neat idea. However, I think side arcs for various uh, characters were made actually better than the main quest. Specifically, Sebastian's story arc being the best of them all and Poppy being close second. I could care less about Nettie, unfortunately, simply because her family troubles seem to pale by comparison to Sebastian's or even Poppy's. Not to mention, Nettie's backstory is revealed way too late, right before the main quest ends, and it's really difficult to care about her at that point. Specifically, the whole deal with her dad and why she and her mom moved out of their native country. Also, why ironically, both Sebastian and Poppy's voice actors did a much better job at their first voiceover gig than some of their more seasoned, seasoned colleagues, which is quite a commendable feat. Music, sound effects, and visuals are fantastic in this game. I love the menu art, uh, some of the fashion choices, some were garbage. Um, unfortunately, the game doesn't have a photo mode to take advantage of its visual properties, which is baffling to me in 2023. I like the broom flying, uh, not so much beasts, as I found the beasts more difficult to control when landing, a hippogriff for example, as opposed to a broom. Although it's cool to fly a hippogriff. I also wish we got better spells arsenal without redundancy of several spells and uselessness of reparo. I'd rather have Patronus charm and some other spells or maybe even ridiculous. Entirety of potion making section felt like an afterthought rather than a proper part of the game content in its systems. Only five or so potions, most of which you will not use unless you play on top difficulty setting, and even then I'm not sure if those po potions are actually helpful with anything. I personally felt like invisibility potion was the most useless of them all. I mainly used a healing potion and sometimes a thunder potion in boss fights. Overall, extremely poor design and implementation of the system within the game. I like the whole animal conservation aspect of the gameplay, but it's very unfortunate that the effort doesn't go anywhere. Young animals don't grow up, you can release them, but you get no brownie points for that. You can resell the the uh, rescued or bred animals, but not only it's not profitable, it also feels wrong. Again, it felt like an activity lacks something to make it feel more complete and meaningful. There are also different color variations of the animals, shinies as one of the articles described them, but it doesn't do anything. Aside from farming materials of the animals, this whole thing feels kind of po pointless. As for the combat, I will briefly mention my impressions. While the combat is quite satisfying, it's also pretty limiting at the same time, with only four spells available at a time. You can, of course, uh, switch mid-combat, but I think the game would have benefited more from 
combo combat system like Marvel Spider-Man had it. It would have been much better fit for the combos as well as allowing it to use a wider variety of spells depending on the key combos. I also think that uh, some of the collectible content could have been reduced in favor of more story involvement and character uh, development. Would I recommend this game? Yes, absolutely. I loved my time with it and I would like to replay it at least twice more to see Jackdaw's questline from Ravenclaw and Gryffindor perspective, plus explore their common rooms. I just wish there was a little more to it. Including the focus on the main problem at hand, ancient magic as properties, origins and nature. And why can why we can see it? Like focus on the protagonist. Let me know if you played the game and what your impressions are about it. Did the game meet your expectations? What house did you end up in? I want to know what your thoughts are about Professor Fig, Sebastian and Hattie. What would you have changed about the game's story or its systems? Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed, please like, comment and subscribe. I hope you have a lovely and safe day. Stay safe and cheers.